Thank you so much. I appreciate that and all that the Lord has done this week with the music. Uh, brother, so good to have you. Um, enjoyed the time so much today. You come. Amen. That's an important song, is it not? Amen. Man, you can take the blood out of the songs. You can take the blood out of the hymn book. You can take the blood out of the sermon, but you'll never take the blood out of salvation. So without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, no blood, no forgiveness. And so thank the Lord that He sent His Son to shed His blood for you and me. Good to see you tonight. Glad you're here. Thankful to see you. Glad that you're in your spot. Take your Bible with me. Let's go to the Gospel of John tonight. The Gospel of John. And let's go to chapter number 7 this evening. John chapter number 7. And we'll look at verse number 1. 
I want to get to verse 37 tonight. Don't worry, we're not going to hit all the verses up to, uh, uh, up, up to 37. But I do want to uh, kind of let you see how we got to verse 37, all right? So we're going to read some verses here at the beginning of, uh, of John 7. We'll take a look at some verses in the middle of John 7. And then we'll get to verse 37 as well. And, uh, you know, this is not profound or anything, but John 7 comes after John 6. And so John 6... Uh, plays a part in the narrative that John is writing through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And John 6 starts with the feeding of the 5,000 and continues on with that crowd following him the next day. They want him to do another miracle. They want him to provide more food for them. And Jesus kind of confronts them a little bit. He says, you seek me not because you saw the miracle, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. And so he challenges them to labor not for meat which perisheth, but for meat which endureth unto everlasting life. Amen. The crowd then is confused. They, uh, they ask him to send them a sign to provide manna for them, as uh, Moses, their father, did in the desert. And uh, Jesus says, Moses gave you not that bread that I'm talking about, but my father will give you that bread. And he that has come down from heaven amongst you. He's talking about himself there. And eventually he says, I am the bread of life. And he that cometh unto me will never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. There's much more debating. And there's a, a, a unique analogy where Jesus equates himself to a bread that you have to eat. And his blood you must drink. And uh, they begin to say, this is a hard saying. Who can know it? And in verse 66, we read that from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. So this is a, uh, a tough period in Jesus' life. And as you come to chapter 7, we find that there are now people threatening his life. And so in verse number 1, it says, After these things Jesus walked in Galilee, that's that upper region of Israel, for he would not walk in Jewry, speaking of Judea, that of Jerusalem, because the Jews, speaking there of the Jewish leaders in John's gospel, sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. And his brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence, and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. So you've got his, 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 uh, his half-brothers here uh, saying, hey, go to Jerusalem, uh, claim you're the Messiah, do, do, do these things, uh, take over, right? And uh, his brothers have doubt. Jesus says in verse 6, my time is not yet come. Your time's always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Go ye up unto this feast, he says in verse 8. I go not yet up unto this feast. For my time is not yet full come. And when he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But then notice verse 10. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast. Not openly as it were, but in secret. Look at verse 14. It says, Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught Verse 37, in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And so the background for John chapter number 7 is this feast of tabernacles, this feast of the Jews and it says it in verse 2, and it says it again in verse 6, and verse, and verse, uh, in verse uh, 4, and it says it again in verse 6, and it says it again in verse 10, in the middle of the feast in verse 14, at the end of the feast in verse 37. And so John is using this feast to provide us a background, a context, if you will, to the story. Now, John's leaving out some details that his original audience would just assume because they're all familiar with this feast. They celebrate this feast. This feast is a part of their life. It'd be like if I, start, if I started my sermon by uh, telling you a story about something that happened on the 4th of July. 
Uh, I don't need to describe what the 4th of July is. I don't need to go into the details of what happens on the 4th of July. We understand what the 4th of July is. We celebrate the 4th of July. We do all the same things that I would do on the 4th of July. And so I'm going to leave out some details about the 4th of July simply because you already understand it. Well, that's what John is doing here about this Feast of Tabernacles. The only problem is we don't know what the Feast of Tabernacles is. <laughs> we don't know what the customs were. We don't know what their context was for the Feast of Tabernacles. So what is the Feast of Tabernacles? Because if we're going to understand what Jesus says and does at the Feast of Tabernacles, we've got to understand what the Feast of Tabernacles significance was. And so the Feast of Tabernacles was one of those three pilgrim festivals that they were required to go to Jerusalem to celebrate for, which is why his brothers are urging him to go to Jerusalem. Everyone's going to Jerusalem. If you're going to proclaim yourself as Messiah, that's the place to do it. Everybody's going to be there. And it's, it's mentioned in Deuteronomy 23. We find them listed again. I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 16. We find them listed in Exodus 23. But the most uh, uh, in detailed description we get of the the Feast of Tabernacles is actually in Leviticus chapter number 23 and towards the end of the chapter verses 39 through 44. And it describes the feast as a seven day period every year that would start on a Sabbath and end on a Sabbath. And you would march to Jerusalem and you would bring with you the branches of good trees, the boughs of thick trees. And you'd bring them with you to the, to, to the city of Jerusalem and you would dwell in booths in those Days. So for seven days, you're going to build a tent-like structure, a sukkah, and you're going to dwell in it. That sounds like a really strange habit. So what's the purpose of it? Because all these festivals have purposes. And so the Bible tells them that you might remember that I caused you to come out of Egypt and dwell in booze in the wilderness. And so this was a reminder to them that God brought them out of Egypt and then had them dwell in the wilderness, this vulnerable place, this dangerous place, and yet God was a people among them. He dwelt in the center of them, in his own tabernacle, and so it was this idea that God provided for you in the past, and so now you're going to celebrate it every year. You're going to remember it, and you're going to remember what it was like to be in the wilderness dwelling amongst the booths, dwelling in the sukkahs. Now, all these events are connected to their past, but they also have significance in their present as well. And so the feast kind of became known as the Feast of Ingathering because it was that time that they took time to reflect upon how God had provided for them in the past, but how he also was very much so still providing for them today. And so they would bring in these crops, these, these fruits, these goodly Things that God had blessed them with from their gardens and from their farms. And, and they would praise God for these things. But it also was connected to a future reality that they needed God to continue to bless them. They still needed God's provision in their life. And the Feast of Sukkot did this perhaps better than any of the other feasts they celebrated. See, in Israel, there's really only two seasons. They got a rainy season and they got a dry season. Yeah, where I'm from in Yuma, we got two seasons too. We got hot and hotter. Yeah, uh, I grew up in the Midwest and there they've got winter and construction. Those are their two seasons, you know. So I don't know what you got here in Virginia. Maybe you got four seasons. Uh, maybe you got an extended three. I don't know what you've got. But in Israel, they've got two seasons. From, from mid-October to mid-April, it's going to rain. And when it rains in Israel, it pours in Israel. They'll get about 26 inches of rain all year long and they'll, they'll almost exclusively get it in those six months. And the next six months are going to be bone dry. I mean, about as dry as you can possibly get in the desert. Well, that can be devastating because, uh, well, water is life, is it not? Yeah, you need water to survive. And while the most of our globe is covered in water, sadly only 3% of it is actually drinkable. And of that 3%, it's really more like 1% because the rest of it is locked in polar ice caps and glaciers and permafrost. And so we, we get 1% of the world's water to drink. And in Israel, they know that better than anyone. Because while you look at a map in the back of your Bible of Israel, you'll see a big body of water over to the west of them. But that's the metro 
Mediterranean Sea. That's salt water, not usable, can't drink of it. In the northern region of Israel, you've got a, a body of water called the Sea of Galilee. We talked about Peter walking on that sea last night. But when you, when you see Sea of Galilee, you really got to think Lake of Galilee, because it's only seven miles long, or seven miles wide, 14 and a half miles long. There's not any part of it you can't see across when you are standing there in Galilee. Uh, it, it's a very small body of water. You can sustain a community like the Galilee region, but not a Enough for the southern regions of Israel at all. And in the south, they've got an even bigger body of water. That's called the Dead Sea, and it's called dead for a reason. It, its salt contents are through the roof. You can pay a heavy fee to go float in it if you'd like to. Okay, yeah. Uh, and then what connects those two bodies of water is what we call the Jordan River. And in the rainy season, that Jordan River flows, and it, it, it becomes quite large. But in the dry season, it shrinks. This is not the Tigris. This is not the Euphrates. This certainly is not the Nile that Egypt has year round to sustain them. And so in Israel, the primary way that they store water is through cisterns. Now, now there are some wells that people have dug up and there are some springs that have been found. But the, pri the primary way the ancient Israelites kept their water was through building cisterns. They began to realize we better steward the water we get for these first six months. Uh, we're going to need this water later. And so if you were to look at a dig like the one that's at Arad today, uh, dates way back to the early Bronze Era, you'll see that they organized their city to flow downhill and everybody's marketplace was around this giant hole in the ground that they built called a cistern. And the goal was that when the rain fell, it would flow down, it would flow down to that cistern and it would fill that cistern. And so at the end of the rainy season, you'd have a full cistern. And so now, in the dry season, you don't have rain. And so you would march down to the cistern, sometimes every week, maybe every day if you needed it. And you'd fill your buckets up with water, and you'd hike them back to your house, and you'd cook, and you'd clean, and you'd drink, and that would be how you would survive. Well, the problem with that is, as time goes on, that cistern gets less and less full. And so by the time you get to the end of the dry season, that cistern's running pretty low. And uh, at the bottom of that cistern is muck and mire and dirt and mud and bird droppings, right? Like the bottom of that cistern's not very usable anymore. You say, well, what's, what's the importance of this? Well, Sukkot falls in the 15th day of the seventh month, according to Leviticus 23, which puts it at the very last week of the dry season. So as these people are preparing to journey to Jerusalem, you mark it down, they march down to that cistern to get themselves some drinking water. And as they fill their canteens, they begin to realize, we're going to need rain soon. <laughs> if, we, it doesn't rain, if it doesn't rain by the time we get back, we're going to be starving here. <laughs> we're going to be in deep trouble here. And so as they packed their tent and they packed their trees and they began to march to Jerusalem with their water and they began to sing songs about how God provided them water in the wilderness through the rock of Flint, through the waters that turned sweet at Marah, they began to remember, that's right, we've got a God that provides for us in the wilderness and boy do we need him to provide for us when we get back home. And so during Jesus' day at the Sukkot festival, early in the morning, they would meet at the temple and they would have something called the Maim Kahim Hachim. All right, that's fun to say. It's called the living water ceremony. And it was at the ceremony that they would pray that God would send living water again. And they began to realize that the day Sukkot ended typically meant that was the end of the dry season, that it was going to start raining again. And so many times on their journey home, rain would fall. And so, man, they began to celebrate this. God's going to send us living water again. And so at night during the Sukkot festival, you feast, you eat, you celebrate, you party. I mean, it's a, it's a good time to be an Israelite. But in the morning, you head to the temple and you begin to celebrate. You begin to pray. You begin to ask God and plead with God to send forth maim kahim, living water. 
And this is how they would do it. The priest would come out after the sin sacrifice was given. He would take a golden pitcher. He would march about two and a half miles down to the pool of Siloam, and he would fill his pitcher up with fresh living water. The pool of Siloam is a little thing built there by Herod the Great. It uh, was uh, catered in through the Gihon Spring, connected to Hezekiah's uh, tunnels. And, and it was supposed to be a community pool is what it was, a place to gather and refresh yourself. And so he dipped that golden pitcher into the pool of Siloam, he'd march back up to the temple and he would pour it over the sin sacrifice. And when you pour water on something burning, smoke fills the temple. And they began to cry out that the Lord was going to send them living water. And they would do this every day for the Sukkot festival. For the first six days, they'd meet and they would pray and the priest would go down. He'd fill up his pitcher. He'd come back and he'd pour it out. Well, on the seventh day, no matter if you came the days before or not, everyone was coming to the temple on the seventh day. That's the last day of the Sukkot festival. They called it Hoshana Rabbah, the great day of saving, the great and last day of the festival. And so that everyone would gather at the temple for the Mayim Kahim Hachim. And the priests decided to do something a little bit different this time because Israelites always do something different when there's seven days in something. They didn't march around Jericho one time on the seventh day. They marched around it seven times. And so this time, the priest would take that golden pitcher, and he'd march down the first time to the Pool of Siloam, and he'd come back up, but he wouldn't have anything in his pitcher. And so the people would send him back. <laughs> we need living water. This is the driest day of the year. We've got to have living water now. Go back down, buddy. And so he'd go down a second time. And as he's going down, a processional of people are following him. They're praying through some psalms. They're praying out words from Isaiah. And he does not fill his pitcher for the second time. He comes back up. He lifts the pitcher up. The crowd goes silent to see there's nothing in there. Well, at this point, a good Jew starts counting how many times he's gone down there. And you can guess, on the third time, he doesn't come back with anything either. Nor on the fourth, or the fifth, or the sixth. But you better believe on the seventh, there were a lot of people saying, make sure, hey, this is seven, buddy. Don't mess this up, all right? You got one job. And on that seventh time, the, the priest would go into the pool of Siloam. He'd fill the pitcher up with water. And as he marched back up, it's recorded that you, were going, that, that you would hear sounds of thunder. <laughs> it wasn't from the sky. It was from the people shaking those palm branches to mimic the sound of thunder. They began to pray, and they began to sweat, and they began to shout, and they began to plead, God, send us living water. And as that priest came back into the temple, the, the noise would be deafening. People would be screaming and shouting and praising the Lord. And he'd lift up that golden pitcher filled with water and the crowd would go absolutely silent. And he would pour that water over the sacrifice to a, rock, to, 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 to a rumbling applause. Now with that in mind, look at verse 37 again. In the last day, the great day of the feast, Hoshana Rabbah, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scriptures has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Hey, you tell me Jesus doesn't have a fill for the theatrics here. Yeah, yeah. This is the most pertinent image at the most pertinent time on the most pertinent day of the week. All week, Jesus has been there at the Sukkot festival. He wasn't going to go at first because he's receiving death threats, but he goes up secretly about mid-time in the feast. He opens himself up in the temple and begins to teach the people. They're astonished. How could an unlearned, ignorant man from Galilee be the Messiah? There's no way you can be the, the, the one that's going to save us. There's no way you can be the anointed one that's going to deliver us from our problems, that's going to that's reclaim Israel's glory. There's no way it can be this Jesus. This, this man from Galilee. No way, no how. 
And Jesus sits there all week being mocked and being ridiculed and being misunderstood. And he goes, no doubt, to the temple on that last day. And he sits there and he watches them cry out to God to send forth living water. Hey, God, we need something to save us. We need something to deliver us. Hey, God, we're thirsty. We're dehydrated. We're deprived. We need living water. And as, as that priest comes back up, for that seventh time, and he lifts up that picture, and the crowd went silent. Jesus couldn't stay silent any longer. Amen. And he began to cry out, Hey, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Hey, for he that believeth on me, as the scripture saith, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Jesus says, Hey, you're thirsty? Come to me and drink. Yeah. You're, you're, your way's not cutting it? Come to me and drink. Amen. Your system ain't working? Come to me and drink. Amen. I am the source of living water. Amen. And when you come to me and believe on me, you will never be thirsty again. Right. For as the scripture says, your belly's going to flow living water water out. Now this phrase that Jesus uses, living water, in the Hebrew it's maim kahim. It's only found two times in all of the Old Testament, both times in the book of Jeremiah. The first time it's mentioned is in Jeremiah chapter number two, as Jeremiah is listing the charges God has given him against his own people. And he says this, my people have committed two evils against me. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and they have hewn them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Well, the picture for the people of God would have been clear. <laughs> Their primary way of living in the dry season was off of the cistern. And if they had a choice between living water or cistern water, there's not a person in their crowd that would have chosen the cistern over living water. Every single person wanted living water. It was better. It was greater. You don't, you don't settle at the cistern. No. Yeah, you have to settle for the cistern. But when, rain, when the rain falls, you collect it fresh. You've got to get to the source of living water. And this is Jesus' way of saying you have been settling at cisterns far too long. You have been trying to rely on things that were never meant to satisfy you in order to fill you up, in order to, 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 to quench your thirst, in order to hydrate you and propel you forward. He says, listen, the cistern cannot, will not satisfy you. The cistern might give you a little, a little pep in your step for a moment, it might be all right to drink every now and then, but that cistern ultimately will fail you. And by the way, the cisterns Jeremiah talks about are broken cisterns that cannot hold water. They've been created by man and they're useless. <laughs> they do not satisfy. Amen. Why would you forsake the fountain of living water for a dirty, broken cistern? It doesn't make sense to Jeremiah. That's the point. Settling at cisterns never makes sense. So why is it we like to camp our tent right by them? Why is it that when the fountain of living water has flowed to us, has in Israel's case chosen them, calls them out of Egypt, provides for them over and over and over and over again, why would you forsake living water? for a cistern. <laughs> we, we live in a camper van. It's out there. And uh, you're not welcome to go see it, but it is out there. And, uh, and inside, uh, that's, where we, that's where we sleep. That's where, uh, that's where you know, whatever. We, we've lived in there for the last uh, five years. And, or I guess this is our fifth year having it. And so uh, we, we've got three boys now. And we, when we first had it, we only had two. And so there's a lot more spacious. And when we were building it out, we had to think about what's the essentials. You know, because you only got 64 square feet of real estate. You know, you got, you got to be very, very, very... Uh, 
picky with what you're going to put in. And we pretty, much, we pretty much determined we needed some sort of a sink with some water. We needed running water. And uh, we needed that water to be able to come out of a sink, to be able to clean and to be able to drink and, you know, whatever. And to be able to brush our teeth, things like that. And so we, we built out the system. And, uh, you know, uh, the easiest way to do it was to fill up, uh, put a hose in a, a big seven-gallon thing of water and put it in and attach a pump to it so that it would pump the water up. Well, my wife, she's like, well, we can't drink that water. We got to get a filter on that water. I said, oh, yeah, you're right. We got to get a filter on the water. Um, you do the research. <laughs> so she did the research. She sent me a link. And it was this link to a seven filtered system. Like apparently you would turn your faucet on and you'd wait five minutes for it to filter through all these things and it would come out and it supposedly filtered out all of the junk, all of the problems, all of this, all that. And you were, you'd be left with nice, good water. Yeah, no way that was fitting in the van. Nope, so not, not going to work. We're going to have to get something else. And so we got a little pitcher that you pour dirty water in and it would filter through the top. And man, I'm telling you, she must have done some good research because you'd pour that water back out into a cup and you'd drink it. And on a hot summer's day in Yuma, Arizona, you'd be left doing one of these. Ah, that's good. That's good water. That's not Aquafina water. No, no, no. That's some good Fiji water. Yeah. That's some, that, that's some glacier water. That's good water. Well, one day we were loading the van on a hot summer day, getting ready to go to camp. And I'm putting all this luggage in. I'm carrying all this stuff out. And man, I'm getting sweaty. I'm getting hot. And so I open that fridge up and there it is. The picture, the, the pitcher of water filled to the top. And I'm thinking, oh, praise the Lord. I pulled out that pitcher, pulled off the top and just started drinking. And the moment that water touched my mouth was the moment it began to come out of my mouth. I mean, I put it in and it was instant. I mean I, I mean, I spit it out. It was disgusting. It was gross. I ran inside. I said, Lexa, this thing's not working. This thing's not right. This thing doesn't work. It, what happened? She looked at me and she said, Eric, that's been sitting in the fridge for about three months. <laughs> The van's been turned off. The fridge hasn't been on. That thing's been cooking in the van for three months. That's not good water. And yet so many of us drink that water. We rely on that to satisfy us. Oh, living water's available. It's flowed to us. But we would much rather rely on the cisterns of this world. John tells us, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now pay attention, because that doesn't mean God doesn't love you. John's going to very clearly state that means you don't love God. Because he says the things of this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, they are not of the Father, but are of this world. And then he makes a point. He says, the world passeth away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. What's he saying? He's saying, listen, don't settle at cisterns. Don't, don't allow the things of this world to, to pull you in and suck you in. Because I'm telling you, oh, yeah, sure, that, that sip of that might be good for a moment. But it's not going to satisfy I think sometimes we rely on the cisterns of this world, but I think also sometimes we rely on the cisterns of religion as well. We really think that putting on a suit and tie and coming to church every morning, eh, 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 every Sunday, and kind of going through the routine, that that's going to fix everything. It's the same thing the people of Jeremiah were struggling with. If you do the research and go to Jeremiah chapter 7, you'll see that Jeremiah is called to go preach a sermon at the temple. And he's going to stand up at the temple as everyone's coming in. He's going to say, hey, people, hey, everybody come on in. The house of the Lord. The, to all the people that say the house of the Lord, the house of the Lord. He says, you liars. You've turned the house of the Lord into a den of thieves. A hideout for criminals. You come to the temple week in and week out. And man, you sing the praises and you wash yourself in the mikvah. You do all the right things. And then you go out 
and you cheat your neighbor and you fornicate and you do this and you do that. And he lists, I mean, these heinous things. And it's like, whoa. And then come back to the temple and you're like, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. But he says, as, you have this idea that as long as you're doing this, whatever you do out there doesn't matter. And he says, guess what? The Lord says, I've seen your works. I've seen what you're settling. I see what's really propelling the engine. You're drinking from a cistern that you've dressed it up as religion. Amen. And I'm telling you, that's exactly what the church in America struggles with today. We can come to church. We can sing the hymns. We can do all the right things. But then we go out. We don't love our neighbor. Man, we'll do anything to make a buck. It's all about us. And then we come back in. We're the people of God. Hey, <laughs> what hymn are we singing today? Yeah, A.W. Tozer said, Christians don't tell lies. They just go to church and sing them. Yeah. I surrender all, Lord. No, I surrender some. I surrender part, Lord. I'm going to keep drinking from my cistern. And there's got to be a point in our life where we say, you know what? That cistern, it does not satisfy Listen, I grew up in a good church. I grew up in a church where there were people being saved and baptized every Sunday. Every Sunday, the baptism water was filled, and there was a pastor that would baptize somebody in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then, about six months later, on a Wednesday night, they would say, hey, congratulations to so-and-so, who they have finished discipleship. And they would come up, and then, about six months later, they'd be teaching your sixth grade class. And you're like, Wow, this guy's not just getting saved, baptizing, and disappearing. He's being saved, he's baptizing, and now he's discipled and a teacher in the church. I get to go back to my home church every summer and preach one of their youth camps. And I'm telling you, I get to go to church on a Sunday morning, and I see people who taught me fourth grade. When I was in fourth grade, they're still teaching fourth grade. That's a long time to be teaching fourth graders. Yeah, and they look like they've been teaching fourth grade for a long time, if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, but man, I tell you, I, I look around at, at a place like, like the church I grew up in, and I say, man, there's a lot of life there. But unfortunately, I look back at my life and all the times I went there, and I said, you know what, I think I, I, think I relied a lot on other people's relationship with the Lord and not my own. I think a lot of times, man, I, I'd come to church, and pastor would preach a good one. You have a pastor that preaches a good one? Oh, come on, that was your chance, church. <laughs> Your pastor ever preach a good one? Yeah, amen, he does. Yeah, and it's one of those sermons where like the Holy Spirit's just all over it and he's all over you, right? And so man, you'll hit the altar. Maybe you won't, I don't know. Maybe you'll sit there in your seat. But I, I don't think you can hear a message where the Holy Spirit's all over you and, and say nothing, right? And so, so we'll do something. We'll, 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 and this is typically what we pray. Lord, <laughs> got me. I'm sorry. Hey, Lord, I'll try again next week. I'll try again next week, Lord. And so, man, I got to try harder. And next week comes and nothing changes. And it's like, well, maybe I got to tie my tie a little tighter. Maybe, I gotta, maybe, maybe my coat needs to be buttoned. Yeah. I, mean, I didn't know the third verse to that hymn. I got to get that third verse down. And we put all of, the basket, all of our eggs in the baskets of performance and dress and outward. And then, man, pastor preaches another good one. And you're like, that's what I need. If I could just bottle that up, that, that is what I need. But we go back home and our marriage is still a wreck. Our kids are struggling. I'm struggling. Still angry. Nothing's working. And the response is, I got to try harder. And you come back next week, and you come back next week, and you come back next week. Well, eventually, you try that long enough, and you realize, well, this just ain't working. And so you just stop coming. Can I just tell you, this is never meant to satisfy us. The church was not like this building, this, all the rituals we do. It's not meant to satisfy you. The only thing that can satisfy you is Jesus Christ. All of this stuff is meant to be a build on top of that foundation. But when you make all of this other stuff the foundation, I'm telling you, you've got a very shaky foundation. And it crumbles and it falls because it was never meant to satisfy you. 
The temple was not meant to satisfy them. The presence of God was meant to satisfy them. That's what the temple represented. It was a place where God dwelt. Well, guess what? John 1 says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Literally what John's saying is the Spirit of God sent Jesus to tabernacle amongst us. He became the presence of God living, embodied in the flesh. He walks it out, and that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, hey, you're here for this. You're, you're here for all the wrong reasons. Hey, I am what can satisfy you. I am what can give you living water. Well, man, this is wonderful. And John is a disciple of Jesus. He's there that day as this happens. But he's not there with a notepad and a pen and paper writing it all down. No. Um, he is there watching. And John writes his gospel, we're told, some six decades after the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. And he's struck by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But inspiration of the Holy Spirit doesn't work like, you know, he's mind controlled to like pick up a pen and start writing. No, he's filled with the inspiration of the Spirit to write down the accounts of what he saw Jesus do. And as he writes and he remembers this story, you've got to realize he's writing to a group of believers who are under the bondage of Roman persecution. For them, persecution wasn't just talked about, it was happening. Death wasn't just something they, they talked about in church. It, they were literally experiencing it. But you'd come to church one week and the person next to you is not there, not because their tummy hurts or because, uh, you know, whatever, whatever, but because they were crucified last week. You know what I'm talking about? Like real persecution is taking place. And so the believers that John writes this letter to, they get this letter and they say, yes, we believe Jesus can satisfy us. We believe he is much more. He is much more better. He's better. He's he, he's more full. He's more rich. He can satisfy us way better than the Roman Empire ever could, than the things of this world ever could. But John, what does living water do for us in a world filled with persecution? And so John wants his audience to know what living water Jesus was talking about that day. And so he puts in the next verse a parenthesis. He says, and that... That living water he's talking about, look at verse number 39. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. John says what Jesus was offering them that day was the Spirit of God. Now the Spirit of God wasn't something new to the people John was writing to. It's not a New Testament thing. The, the word here is the word pneuma, but it comes from the Greek word, it comes from the Hebrew word ruach, and ruach shows up on the very second verse of the first page of the book of Genesis, Amen. where the Bible says that the Spirit of God was hovering over those waters, and it was from that Spirit of God that the Word of God came forth to speak and life was made. And so the Spirit of God became this, rep this representation that when the Spirit of God moves, life is there. New life is there. And all throughout the Old Testament, people would get the Spirit of God and they would go do something that nobody else could do, but then the Spirit would leave them. It would depart from them. It came for temporary moments and then would flee. And so what, what Jesus is saying in the New Testament, he's saying, I am the source of living water. You're thirsty, come to me and drink. For he that believeth on me, Jesus, as the scripture saith, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And this spake ye of the Spirit of God. So John is saying that that living water is the Spirit of God that comes to you the moment you believe on Jesus as Savior. You get every bit of the Spirit of God you're ever going to get the moment you trust Jesus as Savior. And John says that that's what Jesus is talking about when he says the Spirit of God, that river of living water is going to flow out of you. He's talking about a permanent indwelling of the Spirit of God that gives you access to the Father, that gives you access to Jesus Christ, that gives you access to the fruit of the Spirit. 
which, my friends, is what this world needs. Amen. He says, man, you want a real difference in your life? Well, guess what? It's not going to come from religion. It's not going to come from playing church. It's not going to come from the things of this world. You want, you want a real difference to happen in your life? It's going to come from the Spirit of God. Amen. And Jesus says he is the source of that cool, refreshing presence of God that takes up residency in your heart and fills you and nourishes you and equips you to go live out the way of Jesus. Yeah, you say, well, how do I know if I'm filled with the Spirit of God? Am I gonna start speaking in tongues? <laughs> no, 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 no. I think, I think what it means to be filled with the Spirit of God is that you're gonna, you're gonna have the fruit of the Spirit in your life. That's the evidence. That's the evidence. The joy, the peace, the love, the gentleness, the self-control. Do you have that in your life? When you're in pressured moments, is gentleness what flows? Or is anger what flows? Is your lack of patience what flows? When, man, someone cuts you off in traffic, is it love that flows? When your coworker shows up late for the 18th time this month, what flows from you today? See, a lot of times we talk about the fact that we want the Spirit of God to flow to us, but Jesus' point is that the, the rivers of living water are going to flow from you. See, revival's understanding that Jesus is exactly what we need, but it's also understanding that Jesus is exactly what this world needs. It's so like, yeah, we need him, but our world needs him. Amen. And guess what? How's the world going to get him? Through us. Amen. Through the Spirit of God moving and directing us. Yeah, the Spirit of God wants to move through you. Are you a clean conduit of living water this evening? Are you a clean conduit of living water tonight? Sometimes I think we think that, man, we got to do this and we got to do that. No, I think what we just got to do is see if, if the fruit of the Spirit is flowing from us. And sometimes it's like, well, man, I know the Spirit of God's in me because today this happened and it took every bit of effort, but I was able to, to show them love. It's like, okay, well, that's great. I'm glad you're scraping the bottom of the ice cream bucket to get that last bit of love out there. No, it's not supposed to be like that, my friends. It's not supposed to be this battle. No, it's supposed to flow from you. Is the Spirit of God flowing tonight? Is it pouring out over you? You say, well, I think I got this part down, but I, I still struggle with this part. No, no, it's not the fruits of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. So you either have it all or you don't got it at all. Because <laughs> you, you can muster up some man-made love, but you're never going to muster up God-like love without the Spirit of God. You can muster up some temporary patience, but you're not going to muster up the patience that, that, that God can put in you without the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit of God that we need in our churches and in our world today. And I'm telling you, I think we're struggling as a church, as a body of believers. I think we're struggling with the Spirit of God. You say, well, how do you know that? Because we, don't even, we, can't, even, we can't even show the Spirit of God to people in our church. We, we can't even love the people next to us. We, we, we can't even have patience with the people in our midst. And part of the problem is we don't even know the people in our midst. There are people we see on a Sunday morning and we never think about until the next Sunday morning. Is there any sort of compassion? Is there any sort of care? Is there any sort of ability to bear someone else's burdens with the Spirit of God in you? Listen, sometimes I think we, we, we think of the Spirit of God as like this, ooh. And, and some of you are like, well, I think the Spirit of God is in the church across town, man. Listen, they don't got a monopoly on the Spirit of God. I'm not even sure what they got is the Spirit of God, right? I don't know. The Spirit of God is something we've got, my friends. And I think we, we, we like, well, how does the, the Spirit of God came to church today? What, what do we even talk about? You think the Spirit of God seeps through the walls when the preaching gets hot? He burns up through the pew. It tickles your thigh. Ooh, Spirit of God's here. No, no, no. The only time this place ever gets an ounce of the Spirit of God is when you come in filled with Him. 
is when you come in filled with the Spirit of God. Yeah, so he, here's the question tonight. Have you grieved him? Have you quenched him? Have you failed to yield to him? Is there a lack of surrender to the Spirit of God? Is there an area in your life where you felt like God told you to do something, you failed to do it, and so now you've quenched him? A lot of times we're real good at shoveling dirt into rivers of living water. And sometimes the first process of revival is to get down on our hands and knees and start throwing out the dirt and start confessing all the times we've thwarted the Spirit of God in our life. We've got to yield to Him tonight so that, as Paul says, we might be filled with the Spirit of God. We, we want to flow the Spirit of God. How do we know we're going to have revival? We'll have revival when we understand that the Spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that thirsteth come and drink of the rivers of living water freely. Yeah, that's in the last paragraph of the book of Revelation. God wants us to drink from the living water. Lord, we thank you tonight that Jesus came to show us living water. We thank you tonight that it's available to us. If we've trusted you as Savior, we have received it. It is ours. Lord, may we not quench your, your spirit. May we not hoard your spirit. May it not be something that just nourishes us, but may it be something that we allow to fill us and equip us so that it might flow and pour out of us to nourish the world around us. Would you show us the areas in our life in which we've thrown dirt on living water? May you give us the grace to repent tonight, to confess tonight, to ask that living water to flow freely through our lives. Father, may, may our kids get living water from us. May our coworkers get living water from us. May our neighbors get living water from us. Lord, we live in a dry, thirsty, dehydrated land. Oh, how we need the pouring of the Holy Spirit. Father, may it come from us, the body of Christ. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm going to ask the piano to begin to play. And you, as you're seated there in your seat, the Holy Spirit has spoken to you tonight. I ask you to respond. Like, let's do this. Let's stand to our feet and Again, if the Spirit of God has moved, you can stay seated and pray there in the pew or come up here to the altar. Let's get alone with God tonight, the source of living water. See, I've relied far too long on the cisterns, on the cisterns of this world or on the cisterns of religion to satisfy my heart. Lord, what I need, I need Jesus tonight. Maybe somewhere along the line, it stopped being about Jesus. Jesus stopped being what you went to to satisfy you. Maybe tonight we, we return to our first love. We go back and in our mind, we, we remember the days when it was all about falling in love with Jesus. Think about the places that you interact. Think about the people that interact with you. Do they get living water from you? What flows from you? May we ask God to allow us to be clean conduits of living water. May we be led by the Spirit of God. There's people here praying. There's time for you to come. Pastor will close our service when the Holy Spirit leads him to.